yeah, so at the beginning, um, yeah, tell us everything about your musical education. I guess it started when I was very little because my dad was an amateur musician. He um, he played the guitar and he played um, hot club quintet style jazz. Um, he was in the Merchant Navy and he did the... Um, West Africa run down to Nigeria, uh, calling it Lisbon. And he had a little band with um, his fellow sailors. And they were all engineers. So um, when they were in port, they could go ashore and play in jazz clubs. And that's what they did. So that was the kind of live music that I first heard. Uh, my dad um, playing at home, his guitar and singing along. Um, for myself, um, I didn't really start um, learning anything about music until I went to a secondary school when I was um, 11 years old and all my friends were taking up musical instruments because it was free in Scotland um, to uh, have musical tuition and you could get a musical instrument free. So all my friends were taking up musical instruments, so I thought I'd better do that too, uh, to be one of the crowd. And um, of course, within six months, they had all given up, uh, but I had been bitten. Um, so that was that. I chose the cello to learn because um, I looked around the walls of the music room and there were uh, posters on the walls of different musical instruments and there were only three that I'd never heard of and they were the oboe, the French horn and the cello. So I reckoned it had to be one of those three and I ended up with the cello and within five years I was um, doing an audition in London at the Guildhall School of Music when I was 16 and I was accepted there as a student of William Pleath. I spent three years at the Guildhall School and when I came out of there I started working as a freelance musician uh, and you could say that's when my education really began. Again, you told uh, your Yeah, play the cello and you're also very versatile in the instrument that you play. Um, so, yeah, what was the story behind learning um, the all kinds of uh, flutes and whistles, etc.? So how did you come up with that? Uh, the story there is that um, one of the first jobs I got um, when I left music college was um, in a contemporary dance company, which in those days was called Ballet Romber. Um, based in London and uh, I toured you know like two thirds of the year um, with them and they had a very eclectic um, music policy so you never knew what um, you were going to be playing next and, and they always tried to do everything with live music rather than using tapes so in about 1981 um, a new ballet was choreographed by Christopher Bruce, um, who later became the, their artistic director. He um, he choreographed a piece about, um, well, it's hard to say what it's about. It's kind of about um, political oppression um, in uh, South America in general and in Chile in particular, and he used music by um, Inti Ilimani. So how was that going to be done live? Well, the musical director of the company just asked for volunteers. Would anyone like to learn how to play these instruments? So I stuck my hand up, as did um, a few others. And we only had, you know, we didn't have the instruments. We didn't even know where to get them. But uh, we heard that um, there was a group um, based in Paris called Los uh, Calchakis, who were sort of retiring 
and they were getting rid of some of their instruments. So we got in touch with them and they sent them over in a crate. And the crate arrived, we opened it, and we took out these charangos, canas, zamponias, and um, we learned how to play them very quickly because we only had two or three weeks in which to do it before the first performance. So, yeah, it was um, it, it was a real panic to begin with. But, um, of course, the music, that, that music is so... We'd never heard anything like it before, and, and we were entranced by it. And so we didn't just stop at playing for the ballet. We, we, we researched and we learned more music and um, we made um, the music was so popular with the audiences, never mind the ballet. I mean, that was very powerful in itself, but the music was um, once again, something that the British uh, audiences had never heard. And so um, we decided to make a little tape uh, of the tunes that we played in the ballet and to sell it in the theaters after the show each night and and it really sold a lot um and somebody sent one of these tapes to a record company it wasn't us we didn't know anything about it they sent one of these tapes and um they got in touch with us and said would we like to make a record so of course we would like to make a record <laughs> who who wouldn't uh, so we made a record and, and it was, uh, we signed a deal for three albums and, and a single was released. We never thought any of this was going to happen. And, and the single went into the, into the charts, into the British charts, into the top 10. Wow. And so all of a sudden we were on TV and, and everything, you know, and, and it became quite a big deal. Um, at least in the UK. So, um, yeah, that, that, that's the story of how we started or how, you know, I, I started and, 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 and my colleague Mike um, started playing those instruments. Um, to cut a long story short, it, it's once again, um, this was something we, we didn't know about, but um, someone sent one of our records to Ennio Morricone um, and and he was looking for musicians to play on his film, The Mission. And so we got a call from him, you know, out of the blue. And, and we went and did a very, um, a very eccentric um, audition in the film company offices in, in central London for Signor Morricone, which basically consisted of him um, playing a, a, on the third floor of these offices, there was a, a, a battered old upright piano, out of tune piano in the corner. And Signor Morricone pounded out all the tunes from the mission and sang them at the top of his voice and said, can you play this? Can you play this? And he said, I think so, yeah. and and <laughs> that was the audition. Uh, a couple of weeks later, we were in uh, CTS Studios in Wembley, in London, uh, recording the music for the mission. And once again, you know that um, that score was quite a powerful score. You know the the you know the movie had a strong message, but the score really, it, you know, it won prizes on its own and and so um it attracted a lot of attention from the film world and from film composers in particular and so um uh, a couple of years later or maybe 18 months later um we got a call from James Horner because he was aware of um our work on the mission score and he asked us to play on his score for a film called Willow and um, that was kind of it. You know, it, it, it was a sort of word of mouth all along. Um, and, and, you know, we just, we just went with it. 
uh, at every um, at every turn of the page, we just said, "Okay, we'll do this. We'll do this." Not really knowing if we could do it, <laughs> but um, but you know, you learn on the job. Mm -hmm. Wow. So I I have a quick uh, follow question follow up question. Did you learn all the fruits and results by yourself, or did you have any kind of mentors that helped you through this amazing? process that you you immediately uh, got hired by the best uh, film music composers we were self-taught um, and because there was no one in in Britain to teach us and we 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 went to see whenever we could go and see um, musicians from um, the Andes in particular playing anywhere we went so I remember seeing the the the, the band Iyapu. They only ever did, as far as I know, one gig in London, and and, and that was in about 1982, and and I was there. Don't worry about that. So you know, and and we listened to as many recordings as we could get hold of. We used to go. <clears throat> there's um in those days the the, the British uh, Museum. Um, has a library department, uh, the British Museum Library, and the library department has a sound department. It used to be called the British uh, Institute of Recorded Sound, and it was in a separate building. It was near the Royal, near the Royal Albert Hall. And so you went there, um, and it was very old school. You know, you 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 went and and you. Um, you signed in, and then a gentleman in a sort of white lab coat, uh, like a like a scientist, um, came out and asked you what you wanted to listen to. So you told him a track, and and he went off, and he, and he, and you you went into a booth, and and put some headphones on, and then the gentleman came and put the track on that you wanted to hear. And you could speak to him on a on an internal phone, and say, "Could I hear it again?" <laughs> and and then he would play it again, you know. And and this was, and then when that track was finished, um, you you went out to the front again, and you asked to hear another track. So, it was a kind of, it was a different world, really. But uh, we did. I I went. I spent a lot of time. In that um, in that place, listening to as many recordings as they could get. Old um, there was an American label called Folkways, which was a sort of anthropological label. You know, they had old seventy-eight records that that people had had made out in the field in Peru, Bolivia, of 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 groups that they found in villages, and you know, we listened to all of that, um, and. You know, we got the style um, because we were willing to get it. I think that is the thing, you know. And then later, you know, we managed to get some better instruments uh, from a, a gentleman called Milton Zapata in Paris. You know, all the all the best South American bands who were in exile um, in Europe, they they got canas from Milton. So we went. <laughs> Once again, it was a kind of funny thing, you know. We we, we just we went to Paris. We had we had no phone number, no nothing from Milton. All we had was an address, at 30 Avenue Rai, near the uh, Cité Universitaire, and uh, so we just we 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 got on on a boat across the Channel and a train to Paris, and and then we went to this address and we knocked on the door. And Milton opened it, and we said who we were, and he got us to play some stuff on the doorstep to see if we were serious. And when he realised that we were, he invited us in, and and we got fabulous instruments from him. He is the best cana maker in the world. He, he's old now, and he has stopped making, but um, he is still the best. And he's also a guru of all that kind of music. So 
we learn them a lot from him about how to play authentically. So uh, maybe that answers your question a bit. Wow. And uh, yeah, have you all, all, uh, other uh, interesting anecdotes uh, when you uh, yeah uh, search or buy your instruments? It's a funny thing, you know. I've I have bought instruments all over the world. Um, um, I've traveled all over the world as a musician, and and, and everywhere I go, uh, my eyes are open to see, you know, what um, what there is, and. I go looking for things, and if if I find the right thing, I know straight away. You know, you can try a lot of musical instruments, and but when one is the right one, you just have to have it. And you can only do that by playing it. You know, I, I don't know. People buy musical instruments off the internet nowadays. I don't know how you could do that. that that's, I, I, I bought a couple um that way and it's um it's not very satisfactory it's it's such a tactile thing to hold an instrument to play it to to feel straight away that it can be a part of you um and because what you play um as a musician is such a personal thing it's it, it's your own voice um then the instrument has to be part of that so do you know what uh, i think that pretty much every musical instrument i've ever bought i have played um if you like um for money you know seriously uh um, and so anecdotes about buying them, there are many. Um, I, I'm just going to say one thing. Th this occurs to me, you know, when you were asking about um, about playing styles. Um, I was, you know, the first couple of films that we did, uh, particularly for James Horner, we... We were trying to play how we thought we should play <laughs> um, for for a film, which is kind of which is kind of to you know we were playing with the London Symphony Orchestra and stuff like this, and we were trying to be very kind of classical and uh, and correct about how we played these flutes. And I remember one one day because the cana. I don't know if you know that know this is played with a very um particular type of vibrato which is done in the throat it's very fast type of uh, vibrato and it's very unusual the, the cana is really the only instrument that's played that way and I was just sitting in the I can't remember what movie we were doing but I was sitting in the studio like you know in the evening just playing the cana in the normal way with throat vibrato and James came running out of the control room and, and he said what is that what are you playing I said it's a cana James he said but I've, I've, I've never heard you play it like that before I said well I, I didn't think that anyone wanted us to play it like that he said um, he said that's the sound that's the sound I've been looking for and I didn't know what it was so from then on, um, I always played the cana with uh, throat vibrato. In uh, certainly in 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 James's films. Mm -hmm. Wow! Yes, you also worked with um, yeah Michael Ny Nyman. Um, have you also uh, some yeah enjoyable moments uh, from working with him? Um, Michael, goodness me! Uh, I've I've been on the road with his band for more than thirty years. There are so many. Um, it's um, I'll say this about uh, playing in the Michael Nyman band. It's um, a kind of inside out kind of a band in the sense that um, the string players are are the drummer of the band. 
so normally you know in rock and roll you've got a drummer and then you've got people playing melodies whether it's keyboards or lead guitar or vocals um, in the Michael Nyman band the strings are the drums so they play really really rhythmic stuff a lot of the time and and the rest of the band the saxophones and the trumpet and and whatever they play over the top of that so it's a really grueling way to play a stringed instrument and um i think that not many string players would like to play that way you know uh, there have been a few um casualties over the years of people who've played with the band but not really been able to uh to keep up with the stamina you know um it takes um it takes the most stamina um out of anything i've ever played certainly on the cello you know because it's non-stop that's the other thing with michael diamond's music it just there, there are there, if you're a string player certainly there are there are no breaks there are no gaps uh, you're just playing solid for the whole gig for two hours however long it is so um that's what i would say about it and as i described that um i was thinking that um of another instance of playing like that um which is in james horner's films he would get us to play um panpipes uh some point is toyos they're called actually very big sort of bass panpipes um playing riffs on those which just repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat um and so that's the nearest you know playing for james or or, or other film composers but I've come to the sort of Nyman thing where it's just, it's so physical. Wow. And yeah, you uh, mentioned him uh, a lot of times. Uh, so yeah, uh, Nirufa has a few questions about James Horner. <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah, so uh, your first album with James was Willow. It was kind of a big budget uh, movie for the uh, music part. Uh, can you remember your first meeting with James? Um, I think that we met him before we started recording. You know, he was satisfied because we'd done the mission. He was satisfied that that we could play what he wanted to us to play. Um, so we we met him. You know, he used to live. He used to live right down because he went to the Royal College of Music. He was a sort of, you know, he lived around the um, South Kensington area near the Royal Albert Hall, um, kind of Chelsea. Uh, so we met him socially down that way. You know, we used to go. There's a pub near uh, South Kensington Station, and um, we used to have um, eat Indian food with him. But um, I remember the first. On the very first day of Willow, the very first session, we were there with the um, with the London Symphony Orchestra, and there was myself and Mike Taylor. There was Robin Williamson of the Incredible String Band. There was uh, Kazu Matsui, uh, all kinds of people, you know, uh, two choirs, and. Um, And, and the first, the very first cue um, was put on the music stand, and it was in a B major, which is a terrible key for you know, uh, um, just technically speaking, most of most folk instruments are in G, which has one sharp in the key signature. B major has five sharps, and we. Mike and I just looked at each other, and we only had one thing that could play this very, very difficult tune. And it was a kind of, it, it was like a tourist flute that we got 
in, in Bolivia. It wasn't even a serious, you know, instrument, but it was the only thing that was in B major. So Mike and I tossed a coin and he lost. So he had to play it. And uh, so the orchestra were playing and it was time to come in with this and Mike gave it his best shot, but it really sounded terrible. Um, and so the orchestra stopped and they were laughing. Uh, and, and, and James wrapped his baton on the, on the stand and he said, uh, you could have heard a pin drop. Um, he said to the orchestra, you know, there's 120 of you here. There are two choirs. There's Robin Williamson, there's Kazu with the Shakuhachi, and there's Mike and Tony. And um, they have just tried to play a cue that I've written a completely in the wrong key. And he said, if any of one of you members of the orchestra would like to come up here and have a go, you're most welcome. And of course, you can, the, the silence, you could cut it with a knife. So that was a, the great thing about um, James. Well, one of the great things was that he, he took risks with the musicians he hired. Um, and he, he took risks with us, and um, but he was always ready to stand up for the musicians and to acknowledge that certainly, you know, ethnic musicians, whether they were playing uh, primitive instruments, which is often the case, um, or whether they were, you know, ethnic type singers, so, you know, not trained singers, singers who sang in a particular style. Whoever it was he had hired, he always stood up for us 100%. And um, that was very helpful. Yes. Uh, and it, Willow is, is a wonderful, wonderful score. Uh, thanks for everything that you've done on that. So uh, your relationship with James Horner, both as a friend and as a colleague, how was it for you? He was a very sympathetic colleague. You know, he, like I've just described with writing something in a, in a difficult key, he was always trying to do the best he could to make these ethnic instruments work. And so he never wrote anything in B major ever again until we got to the Titanic. And by that point, I had instruments which could play in that key, and he knew that. He was a very good friend. He was a very private man, and he kept to himself to himself, and so do I. So from that point of view, we understood each other. And I think that we had um, an unspoken understanding about how music should be. So, um, you know, he, he knew how he thought I was going to play. And I think that I knew how he wanted me to play. And so both of those things uh, met in the middle. And that is how our relationship, our musical relationship was a sympathetic one, always. So yeah, we, we, we most of the time we didn't have to say anything. I knew what I had to do. He knew that I knew. <laughs> and um, that's kind of how it worked. And, you know, I, I, he asked me to help him with um, other musicians as well, because um, some of the other uh, people who would come to play were... were because um, often you know, they were, they came from a different tradition. Um, you know, I, I, I was accustomed to playing, to reading music, for example, and to playing with an orchestra. But a lot of the people he would get to play for him 
had had no experience of that at all. They were they were in a completely different universe, uh, and 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 so far out of their comfort zone. Um, so, I I a lot of times I I sort of was like a go between, um, helping those other musicians to be able to do what I knew James wanted them to to come up with, you know, to facilitate. <clears throat> and sometimes he would just he would just go away and and, and leave me to it. You know, particularly um, particularly in the case of vocalists, you know, he would he would say to me, How long do you think it will take? And I would say, I don't know, depending on what we had to do, who it was, two or three hours, three, three, four hours maybe. And he would go away and leave us to do it and then come back. Um, so he had that level of trust um, in the people um, he worked with. And not just me, obviously, you know, the... Sean Murphy, Simon Rhodes, Ian Underwood, you know, the people, Jim, Jim Hendrickson, his people, if you like, you know, he trusted them immensely with um, getting the job done and, and helping him to get it done. Yes, I had the privilege of uh, meeting Mr. Riegler this February. Uh, one thing that he mentioned was that when he wrote a part for Ilium Pipes, it was not only for Ilium Pipes, it was for Eric Riegler. Uh, would you confirm, and all the music, all other musicians too, would you confirm that? Well, after a while, um, if James or, or, or even, you know, other composers um, who, who frequently use the same musicians, you know, they get to know how that musician is and how they play. You know, James got to know Eric's playing. He, 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 he already knew it. And I'm just trying to think what was the first um, film Eric did. I, I, I know how James got to know Eric uh, because... Uh, Mike Taylor and I went to um, a, um, what do you call that? Uh, it was, a, you know, the Super Bowl. Um, you know, they have a, they have a Super Bowl party when it's, when it's the final in, in people's houses. And, and we went to, um, it was, I think it, it was a Sunday and, and, and we were in LA and, and we weren't working that day and we were invited to a Super Bowl party in the house of a sort of someone's cousin in Orange County. So we went to this party and, and Eric was there. He was a young man and he was playing the pipes. And, and Mike and I were very impressed with his playing. So we took his number and the next day in the studio, we said to James, look, um, we heard this guy playing Ullen pipes at a party yesterday. He's really good. We took his number. Here it is. And so uh, James took our word that uh, if we thought Eric was going to be good, then, then he probably was. Uh, or, or we wouldn't have given him his number. And so he rang him um, to play on a film. And I, 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 you'd have to ask Eric. I can't remember which was the first one he did. But um, once again... It was again, Braveheart, I think. Uh, maybe it was Braveheart. Yeah, yeah. Maybe. Uh, unless it was... Maybe it was Braveheart. Okay. He played on a film called The Devil's Own. I can't remember if that came first. No, I think Devil's Own is, is afterwards. Mr. Riegler also had very good words about you. So my next question is that uh, you have been the soloist of timeless movies such as Titanic, Braveheart, Field of Dreams, Legends of the Fall, Mask and Legend of Zorro, uh, and the list goes on. Uh, what do you think uh, has made these scores musically timeless? 
and what can you tell us about uh, the recording session of some of them uh, and your important role uh, as a soloist? What makes the uh, what makes a score timeless is just simply its quality. Um, if 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 a score has music of the highest quality, it will be timeless, and it will exist in its own right apart from the film. You know, some film scores um, are perfect um, with the film, but um, on their own, you really you wouldn't want to spend much time listening to them. But there are certain, um, you know, I could name scores that, uh, you know, going back, scores such as um, Dr. Shivago or uh, Lawrence of Arabia or all, all sorts of, um, those are both more jar, I guess, uh, as I think about it. But, um, you know, they're they're just high quality music. And, and James Horner was a more than capable of, of, of writing music of the highest quality. So, you know, Braveheart is one of those scores. There's no doubt about that. The Titanic is one of those scores. There's no, no doubt about that. Legends of the Fall, to me, possibly even surpasses um, both of those other ones. Um, I, I'm not in the business of... of saying what my favorite is or, or whether one is better than another but um the, the legends of the fall music is just top class uh, as far as um recording individual scores go I, i'm, I'm going to give you three examples um one is um a score that um was um, was binned a James Horner score for a film called Young Guns, uh, where, which uh, I think was something like 1989. Uh, we recorded Young Guns in the old air studios at Oxford Circus um, in London. And um, the score was binned because the producers thought it was, well, their words, they said it was too dark, which is, um, it certainly was dark, and and um, it, it brought out all the darkness um, in the story of the film. But, um, you know, everyone's had a score binned at some point, and, and James is no exception. But the reason I picked that one out is because Previously, um, we had worked in a sort of w where everything was written out. You know, they were orchestral scores, all the music was written, and there was very little scope to um, make things up. I mean, we did a bit of making it up in, in, in Willow um, and to an extent in The Land Before Time, but um, Young Guns was, was the first one we did, which was really kind of improvised. The whole thing from, you know, we, we, we went in to the studios. There was not a note of music written ever. And we improvised pretty much the, 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 the score. And there were a number of techniques um, in that score, which even though the score was thrown in the bin, those techniques were given life, such as the sort of panpipe riffing and stuff like that uh, as, a, as a tension building device. And so those techniques uh, lived on. So for example, um, in the Patriot Games, which came quite soon afterwards, um, that technique was, um, was used there, which we had um, invented, if you like, for uh, the Young Guns score. That's one thing. The other two, things that spring to mind are just instances of how music works with a film and, and how, how much I learned um, about uh, the relationship of music to a film um, through the eyes of the director rather than the composer. I, I mentioned The Devil's Own um, as uh, 
something that Eric and I worked on, um, and also Sarah Clancy uh, did the vocals. Um, that was, I remember Alan Pakula was the director of that film and a most accomplished and intelligent filmmaker he was. And I remember we were um, scoring one uh, sequence of the film and, and Alan said that in this bit, he wanted to show purely through music what was going on in the um, in the characters' minds. And uh, I don't know if you know um, the um, story of that film. It's basically um, Harrison Ford is a New York cop and Brad Pitt is an IRA guy who has gone to America to, to buy ground-to-air missiles to shoot down the British Army helicopters. And he's living under an assumed identity in America. And, and he's a, he stays in Harrison Ford's house uh, because Harrison is a, is a, like an Irish American. And at some point, um, Harrison Ford's character begins to realize that something isn't right here, that Brad Pitt isn't quite who he says he is. And and so in this sequence, um, Alan Pakula wanted to show that in, in music. So we said, all right, um, play us the sequence in the film. So so he played the sequence and, and we all watched it and said, well, I don't, I don't know. Where, where is this place that you want to point out? And he said, OK, play it again. So it played the sequence again. And he said, there, and stop the film. And we said, well, it's just a, it's a shot of Harrison Ford. Uh, nothing happens. He said, that's right. Um, he said, but that is the point um, at which inside his head, he realizes that something is up. And he said that when they shot that scene, he didn't tell Harrison Ford because he said that he would be unable to resist doing something, just moving an eyebrow or some, you know, his expression changing even slightly. So, so Alan Pakula didn't tell him, but he knew that at this point inside the character's head, something has changed and he used music uh, to show you know that 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 change happening so that was a very instructive to me you know and um a, a, another instance is um in in the film apocalypto which is another score that was entirely improvised um from start to finish and mel gibson the director had been out of town i don't know he, he wasn't in London, and, and so we were scoring away. And um, we did this um, one day, we, we, we did, I don't want to give the plot away um, in case, uh, but if you have both seen the, the, the film, you'll know that um, right at the end is something really shocking and, and major happens right at the end of the film. And so we were scoring that bit and, um, and, and Mel turned up in London, you know, at, at the end of that day. And, and so we played him that scene with the music that we just recorded and he watched it and he didn't say anything. And, and he just sat almost kind of, you know, like this, you know, with his head in his hands. Uh, for what seemed like a very long time. And and the rest of us were just kind of looking at each other, thinking, oh dear. And eventually he looked up and he said, okay, now I'm a guy sitting in a multiplex cinema on a rainy Wednesday afternoon somewhere in the Midwest. And I'm the only person in the cinema and I don't get that, what you've done. 
and James Horner completely understood what he meant that Mel put himself into character he said I'm now he said I'm now the person that I'm trying to sell this film to and as that person I don't get it what you've just done so the whole thing went in the bin and we started again and um, did it a different way so you know that was instructive um, in the sense that um, you can do what you like when scoring a film but you have to speak to the kind of people that the director wants to reach he doesn't just want to reach um, film industry insiders or intellectuals or he wants to reach if you like the common man so yeah that, that was a lesson thanks very much for all the memories and anecdotes so one more question about the improvisation so how is the improvisation process for you? You've mentioned a couple of scores already, but uh, you you have also done some impro improvisation on Field of Dreams. Did James start the uh, music ideas and you expanded them, or uh, he got the ideas initially from you? It's hard to remember. Um, you 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 mentioned Field of Dreams. It's such a long time ago, but. Um... I think that, you know, he just, he kind of watched us playing and and the sorts of things that we did. And and then he would pick out um, things and, and say, could you play a bit more around that? You know, for example, he would say, can you, can you set up a little, a little loop thing, you know, um, play one phrase and then just keep looping it. So we would just do something that um, hopefully that that the instrument would do almost on its own. You know, you pick it up and you blow it and this is what comes out and you use that because then, you know, you're using what the instrument does best. So he was very, um, he, he was very tuned in to, um, what because these are primitive instruments you know they're basically they're just a bit of stick oboes and clarinets and bassoons uh, are, are, are very sophisticated nowadays um they all started out as a bit of stick um but the instruments that we are playing are actually still just a bit of stick with a few holes in it and um, and so you know they do what they can do um, James Horner was a composer who completely understood that. You know, I, I've played for all kinds of other composers um, and, and some of them don't get that at all. You know, they write a whistle part without really knowing anything about the whistle. You know, they, they write the music down and, and above the music they write the word whistle. And, and that's... You know, that's the connection. And, and, and that is why I, I have so many instruments, because I, I have to turn up to sessions with sometimes hundreds of instruments, because I don't know which one is going to be the one that works, if any of them work. But the thing with James was that he knew, he knew what he was writing for. And he was um, he was sympathetic in that sense. So after that after that very first cue in Willow, um, nothing had ever happened again. So were you also uh, inspired by the visuals during the improvisation? Yeah, um, sometimes he would uh, just um, ask me to go. You know, just watch a sequence of the film and just play something. Just play whatever came into my head. And because of the nature of our working relationship, I sort of knew what he meant. You know, I knew what he was after. 
um, and and hopefully I could supply that. Um, I think there was one, yeah, there, there was one place, for example, this is Apocalypto again, um, where where the um, the uh, the female lead, if you like, is giving birth to a child in a very dangerous situation and it's fraught with emotion and he said just go and watch this watch it again watch it again as many times as you like and then we'll roll the tape and you play something and um so you know sometimes that's what we would do because it wasn't really a question of playing a musical phrase it was just trying to use the instrument to capture the emotion of the moment. So it wouldn't, it may not necessarily be a melody. It would just be something, you know, a sound. Apocalypto uh, recording sessions are a little bit of that is on YouTube and they're very amazing, exotic and unusual kind of uh, instruments that you play and it's a great score to you. So next question is that James was hugely acclaimed for uh, his beautiful Celtic scores like Braveheart, Titanic, Bobby Jones and Devil's Own. Uh, and you have been uh, there for all these projects. As a spot and a flute player, did you have more opportunity and freedom to bring ideas to these projects uh, and a very emotionally more attached to these projects compared to the others? I think that, you know, um, growing up in Scotland, a lot of... I'd say that, that you know, what you would call Celtic music, it, I, I was kind of uh, steeped in it. I completely, uh, it's in my blood, uh, I think, um, is what I can say. And I, I don't really know how to describe that. Um, just um, when I play Celtic music, um, I know how to play it. Um and I, I, I kind of didn't have to learn that. You know, I, I had to learn how to play Bolivian music. I had to learn how to play Chinese music. But I didn't have to learn how to play Celtic music. Uh, it was already there somehow. What I will say is that, um, is that I, I, I play the Celtic music, it, kind of in my own style. So, um, you know, one of the things about um, Celtic music is the ornamentation, uh, the little twiddles and uh, things that you you decorate um, a tune with. And um, the ones that I do, um, some of them are kind of authentic. And, and and others are are of my own invention. They're personal to me. Um, and so there are certain ornaments that that became. I hesitate to use the word trademark, um, but just ornaments which 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 became personal to me. And and so and so James and 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 then other composers eventually would, would, would look for them. They would, they would want me to play that kind of ornament. And, um, and if it was another composer, you know, I'd go along and I'd play um, their, their melody and then I'd put one of these ornaments in and they would say, ah, yes, that's it. That's the one I was waiting for. So, those ornaments are sort of, they're not strictly Celtic. They're, 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 they're a cross between Celtic and Arabic. But you could say that um, that's what Celtic music is, you know, a long time ago, a very long time ago. Um, that's where the Celts came from. So it's all connected. 
Yeah, those ornaments uh, have made uh, James's Celtic score really beautiful. So um, you've written on your website that Mighty Joe Young uh, has some of the trickiest parts you have ever played in film music. It's uh, one of the Horner fans' favorites, especially for the wind instruments. Uh, can you tell us what was so hard about playing uh, those instruments? Yeah, I can. I, I remember it like it was yesterday. Um, uh, it's, it's a technical thing. Um, just because of how the, the main theme for Mighty Joe Young goes do -de -do -da -da -da, do -de do -de do 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 well that do -de do -de, um goes between um, if I, I, I haven't got an instrument to hand here or I'd, I'd actually show you but um, of those two notes the da -da -da -da, the lower one has two fingers on and the thumb hole covered and the upper one has the two fingers off and only half the thumb hole. So it's a technical thing, trying to get your fingers and move your thumb like that very quickly. Um, that is what made it so hard. And, and, and that theme just keeps coming. It comes again and again and again. And also it's, it's in the key of A. So there's only one cana that can play that, which is a very small, very delicate one. So just, it, it, it was a technical thing um, that, that made it so hard. And, and you know, it, it, it was, I, I can't blame James for that because um, he, in, in all good faith, um, I said it was perfectly, I mean, sometimes he would, you know, um, when he was writing a film score, he would he would send me his sketches of, of the melodies that he was writing and ask me if how feasible they were. And he probably he probably sent me that one and I, and I wrote back and said, yes, it's fine. Carry on. <laughs> <laughs> so I I dug my own grave. <laughs> It would be a dream to uh, see you playing that live uh, if you uh, have your instruments around. But for interview, we continue with the questions. You've been uh, the music assistant uh, for James in movies like Apollo 13 and, and music pro producer in Four Feathers, both Zorro Scores and so on. What was your job uh, other than a performer in those projects? Um, well, I can say in Apollo 13, um, James got me to come in to help, um, kind of like I described earlier um, with Annie, because she was, I've got to say this about Annie, she is such a trooper. Uh, I've never seen a vocalist work that hard as she did, you know, a 14 hour day singing um she was completely out of her comfort zone um not only you know normally when she does her vocals um she she's in a in a small studio with her own producer in a situation that she's uh, very familiar with and comfortable with and suddenly she's walking into abbey road studio one which is a vast space with all kinds of people that she's never met before. And, you know, it, it just was a different world for her. And, and James knew that that was going to be the case. And so he asked me if I would come in and just not exactly produce her vocals, but just be the sort of nice guy on, on the other side of the, of the desk, you know, um and and so that that was my role to help with the recording of the vocals um as far as the four feathers goes um there were um eight drummers um on that score uh, all from different um ethnic backgrounds uh there were two indian drummers uh one a kind of hippie style drummer, uh, one uh, Latin American Brazilian drummer, one Egyptian. Um, and um, James asked me 
to get these people together. So I knew all these drummers from different um, walks of life um, based in London. So I, I got them all together and and it was my job to sort of to sort of manage them you know um because they all had quite um different and um ebullient personalities and they came from different uh, musical worlds and different musical styles but they all had to play together um and uh, that was kind of my job to make sure that happened and the same thing with the flamenco dancers uh, in Zoro scores too, right? Yeah, same thing. You know, once again, um, before um, the first one, which was done in London, uh, James got in touch with me and he said, I, I've got this idea for this upcoming score. He said, I'd like to use the, um, the, 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 the flamenco dancers um physical things their finger snaps and their stamps and the noises that they make which are not singing or guitar playing the the other noises which are part of flamenco he said i want to use those as musical instruments he said can you find me people who will be able to do this so once again i was on a, a scouting mission as as I had been many times for James, you know, he, he he would generally entrust me with being the person who uh, procured the musicians that he was going to work with, uh, and and that if I got them, then he was satisfied that they would be okay. Um, so I did find. Um, these uh, guitarists and uh, dancers, and we set up um, in Air Studios, the new Air Studios um, in uh, North London. We set up um, these uh, false floors, which the which they danced on, and so they um, uh, to make the, the 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 sound of their feet more resonant, like a sounding board, you know. So um, these special floors were constructed and they were mic'd up and and the sound of the feet was was recorded um, in that way. And also the clapping and the finger snapping, they were all done, you know, as as musical instruments. And, and it, it, once again, it was my job to sort of make sure that that happened. Those are all beautiful, beautiful scores. So my last question on this part, uh, I know it's a hard question, but is Magnificent Seven your uh, last film music project? And how was it uh, emotionally for you to play on James Horner's last score that Simon Franklin completed? Um, emotionally, um, it was the same as the others um, in the sense that um, I wanted to give the best that I could for James Horner, who was a, a musician and a composer I had the greatest of respect for. And I wanted to do the best I could, so that's what I did. And I thought that that would be the best tribute that I could make, is to just do the job that I'd always done to the best of my ability. I mean, I had played on his last actual score, um, his actual non-posthumous score, the 33, and that was, um, well, none of us knew it was going to be his last, but um, it was the same thing. You know, I just tried to do the best I could. The Magnificent, the, the Magnificent Seven was, was not strange in the sense that um, it was the same way that I worked on Avatar, you know, just by recording a lot of stuff and giving it to Simon and Simon uh, for them to uh, chop up and stick wherever they wanted to stick it in the score. That You know, that's how Avatar was done. That's kind of 
it's kind of the modern way you now. So um, from that point of view, uh, it wasn't a strange experience. I mean, I, I, I recorded Avatar in, uh, in two stints in London. You know, whilst uh, the score was being put together very, very slowly and painfully in um, in Calabasas. So, you know, it's a strange way of working, but it's, it's the way it's done a lot of times now. I also have a James Horner question. Um, yeah, because let's talk about your beautiful album uh, camera. And yeah, again, James Horner. Um, but this is, um, yeah, on your album, there's a track f uh, with the music from the rejected score you mentioned, uh, Young Guns. Um, and it's, yeah, really sad that we never hear more from the score because this track is really amazing. Um, and yeah, was the score recorded? And how was it possible that you uh, put your ar arrangement from this track? Well, um, And because um, that score was, I, I considered it to be so good um, uh, out of all the James Horner scores that I'd played on. Um, that album came about because, you know, the record company I was working, uh, I had a contract with at the time. Um, the, the, basically, they came to me and asked me if I could do um an album of music that i'd played on um with no budget at all <laughs> so and it had practically no budget so i i agreed to do it because um as a sort of discipline i wanted to see if i could make an album of film music film music is very expensive to record usually it, it, it takes a lot of musicians and and I had hardly any musicians I had mainly me and one or two others and I, I it was a kind of challenge to myself to see um, if I could do it for next to no money um, and I, I because the young gun score never saw the light of day And because I held it in such high regard, um, I asked James if I could um, include um, some music from that. And I um, I sort of, I put together that track um, based on an amalgamation of about two or three cues from the, from, from the Young Gun score. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I thought it was a great score and I wanted to include uh, something from it and, and he, he gave it his blessing. Oh, yeah, because it's just, yeah, amazing and beautiful and yeah, I love it. And is there maybe sometimes a volume two is planned or something from that album? Uh, not from me, I don't think so, no, no. Uh, well, <laughs> not that I know about Who knows? I mean, I'm I'm kind of doing uh, different stuff nowadays. So um, I, uh, I I'm always open to suggestions. If someone wants me to <laughs> have another go at making a film album for no money, I'll I'll try it. Um, I, I'm sort of satisfied with uh, with that project. It was okay. It was what it was, um, and uh, it's quite a while ago now. So I just. Now that you mention it, uh, I, I've just remembered another thing. Um, another thing that came from those um, Young Guns sessions. Um, if you listen to the track on my camera album, you'll hear this kind of um, clacking noise, like a sort of wooden clacking, uh, almost like castanets, but, but not really. And that is... Um, That is me um, bashing the back of a wooden chair with two drumsticks. And uh, myself and Mike Taylor, um, we, we, this was one of the things that we just did it in the studio. And James said, oh, that's great. That's a great sound. Um, let's use that. So all the way through that Young Gun score, we did this um, hitting the backs of wooden chairs with two drumsticks and we destroyed 
um, about three or four chairs in our studios, they were completely destroyed uh, <laughs> by the end of the film. So yeah, that was a um, that was one of those. And so that technique of 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 hitting things, um, th things which are not musical instruments, um, that was a thing. You know, for example, in um, when we did Apocalypto, um, I spent a couple of evenings um, after the musicians had all gone, uh, myself um, and I guess it was Ian, Ian Underwood, or who else worked on that score? Anyway, uh, we um, we went round Abbey Road, um, hitting everything in the studio. So. Um, like the uh, the metal railings on the stairs, um, all of the chairs, the uh, the 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 um, soundproof screens, uh, the windows, uh, the everything that we could hit with sticks, we hit it and and sampled it, and then those sounds were turned into musical instruments to be played on keyboards. So. Once again, it's that sort of thing of um, finding a new sound. Um, James Horner was always keen to find, he, how he would describe it would, would be that um, he wanted the listener to, to hear something on the screen and say, what's that? I've no idea what that is. Um, so a lot of times he he would um, get us to just find him. I remember you you mentioned um, Bobby Jones, the uh, the golf movie. Um, this is a this is a, a, an example. Um, Eric Rigler and I were working on that film, and and while while we were working on it, um, the. The news came through that um, Gabrielle Yared's score for Troy had been binned, and and James was being asked to write the replacement score. So um, so he, he accepted. He took it on, and he had almost no time to do it. You know, like twelve days or something ridiculous um, to come up with more than two hours of music. So he said to Eric and I, um, could you, could you just, well, me in particular, could you just stay here in California? Don't go home. And uh, you and Eric um, get in a car and just go on a road trip and, and bring me back anything you can find that sounds weird. He said, I don't care what it is, just bring it back. So off we went. We spent a week on the road just uh, finding strange musical instruments and and we brought them all back and we played all of them on Troy. Um, so, you know, that's the kind of, once again, that's the, um, that's the thing of just it, it being a sound that you can't identify. Um, he was always um, looking for things like that. Well, and yeah, and when you mentioned Zorro, I thought, yes, uh, I wonder uh, a lot of years, uh, yeah, for for uh, no, uh, until now, um, if it was a, a real flamenco at the beginning. And so, uh, yeah, when you say the, the, the clapping and the foots and so, the uh, really dance flamenco for that score, that's amazing. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> they are real mm -hmm. dancers. Yeah, awesome. And yeah, though I'm happy and listen to it again, it's like, yeah, real flamenco. <laughs> and yeah, you uh, just work for a small group of film music composers. Um, and why is it so? Yeah, well, I, I've done stuff for all kinds of people. Uh, but um, I, I mainly worked with James and with Michael Nyman. Um, you know, I've, I've done something for John Williams. I've done stuff for... Uh, George Fenton, Basil Polidorus, um, uh, Vladimir Kozma, um, you know, all kinds of people. 
Um, but um, usually just a one-off here or a one-off there. Um, but uh, yeah, just um, with James, it just, you know, it became a, um, a sort of a lifelong thing, really. Um, because um, I guess we worked well together. And um, I guess you could say the same, you know, I, I, I was always Michael Nyman's cello player because because I understood his music um, and how he wanted it to be played. So uh, you could say that um, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, so that, that's kind of <laughs> what it's been like. Um, yeah, but you know, I'm I'm a freelance musician. I, I will I will I'll, I'll work with anyone. Um, uh, that's what I do. That's my job. Great. So uh, yeah, when Ludwig Göransson calls you tomorrow, you work for him also. <laughs> wait, wait, sorry, what, who? Uh, Ludwig Göransson, Black Panther, and Mandalorian. <laughs> when, if if you if he would call you, you would uh, uh, yeah work with him. I meant. Uh I, I sure I don't really mind I, I just I just like to play the best I can for whoever wants me to play for them you know mm. and I don't mind who it is um if I can if I can do it I'll do it and um yeah have you uh, had any concert projects based on what we have heard uh, you were supposed uh, involved in Titanic live and Braveheart live if it yeah ever happens um i don't know um we'll see i don't do much live playing nowadays um i i i record music every week um in a in a in a friend's studio locally and um right now that's mainly what i'm doing next week next year i don't know <laughs> that's in the future um, I, 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 I'm not saying that I have stopped playing live. Um, I just, I'm not playing live right now. Um, and yeah, besides the uh, film music, you played many classic pieces and recording some albums with your band, Incantation. Um, yeah, and from all this, uh, is something that you prefer? Um, a, a type of music that I prefer or... Um, no, I, I don't think there is. Um, no, I, 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 I like all music, um, if it's any good, um, from, from any genre. Uh, jazz, country music, reggae, um, you know, traditional music. Uh, um, classical music it, it's all um, it's all fine you know I, 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 I couldn't say that there was any one genre that I would pick over the others um, if I had to go to a desert island and just take a one genre of music it would probably have to be classical music because that is, I'm not going to say um, it's the deepest music because that wouldn't be true. Um, but it is the most colorful and the most intellectually stimulating. Um, and 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 the most wide ranging. So if I if I had to pick one genre, I guess it would be classical music. Um, but um, that's not to say that it's that the others are inferior. They're just different. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yet, uh, back to film music. Um, what was for you the best scoring session? Oh my goodness. Um, I think uh, I couldn't pick one. Field of Dreams was um, a nice 
project to work on because um, once again, it was a, a small, a very small group of people in a very small studio. And it was the first time I worked in the USA. So I have a, um, fond memories of that. I think really the scores which were largely improvised are the ones which I enjoyed the most. So the likes of um, the likes of Young Guns, uh, the likes of um, Apocalypto or the Four Feathers, or Patriot Games, even you know, uh, where we just started with an idea. I remember. Um, you know, one one of the one of the cues uh, uh, of Patriot Games started out with uh, um, James used to have a, a, a musical instrument called an anklung, which is um, a, an ethnic sort of a. It's difficult to describe what it is. It's from it's um, from Thailand, or that region, and it's kind of like a. It's not exactly like a xylophone. It's, it, you, you need to look it up, but it makes um, it has a particular um, type of clanky wooden bamboo sort of a sound. And usually it has about uh, eight notes and they're all uh, in a row on a stand. And uh, James got Mike Fisher, um, who, whose anklung it was. Mike Fisher, the percussionist in LA, to take two of the notes off the stand and to shake them like this, like rattles. And they made a rhythm that went ding, diggy, ding, diggy, ding, diggy, ding, diggy, ding, diggy, ding, diggy, ding, shaking these two um, uh, um, anklung notes at different times. And that, that riff, dun, diggy, dun, diggy, dun, diggy, dun, was the beginning of a whole series of tension sequences in Patriot Games. And so to that um, anklung thing would be added a panpipe riff and then some keyboard stuff and then some, some shaker or other, you know, like a chicken shake or something like that. And just seeing how a cue can start um, a cue for a big Hollywood movie can start with a couple of bits of bamboo being shaken in a rhythm and that's the start of it and by the time you're finished it's a whole big thing um, so that that kind of improvise, in, improvisation style uh, creation of musical cues uh, is immensely enjoyable to me and and very instructive. Wow, and yeah, and also I'm yeah very curious. And so, what was for you the worst scoring session? Worst one. Hmm? Um, uh, you could say the worst one is the one where you don't get to play anything. And uh, and all of us all of us have had um, uh, those uh, experiences. So I I got a call to go and play on a film called Radio. Um, and um, and so I said fine. I put it in my diary and uh, two weeks in Los Angeles and and the night before. I was due to get on the plane. I got a call from Jim Hendrickson saying uh, the director has changed his mind. Um, he doesn't want any ethnic instruments in his movie at all. Um, I said, oh, okay, um, what should I do? He said, well, have you canceled the other work to do this? I said, well, yeah, I have. He said, well, why don't you just come anyway? <laughs> so I went. <laughs> I went to LA and I turned up at the studio every day and I sat there and uh, and I didn't play a single note 
for two weeks and then on the last evening um, James said why don't you just play something on the main title uh, and we'll see what the director thinks of that so I, I played some stuff on that and we played it to the director and he said no <laughs> so uh, you could say that um, it's not very difficult to sit doing nothing for two weeks, but um, it's frustrating because uh, I'm a musician. I want to play. Mm. Great. And yeah, speaking of play, uh, so yeah, what are your current and uh, yeah upcoming projects? Well, right now I'm um, I'm recording uh, a lot of um, I'm writing and recording a lot of uh, library music. Uh, and mainly for marimba uh my <laughs> we were asked to to supply um pieces of music that included the marimba by a library music company and uh, myself and and my um colleague who is a percussion player and a studio owner so um we couldn't imagine how we could write lots of music for the marimba, but once we started, uh, we've recorded um, 28 tracks now of, of marimba pieces. So um, uh, that's what I'm currently doing right now. That's what I was doing yesterday, and that's what I'll be doing next week. And when I'm finished that, um, I, I may record a cello album. What will happen to that? I don't know, but I'll record it anyway. Great. Um, and yeah, we reached almost almost the end. Um, yeah, one thing. Um, yeah, so so called five words, five answers. Uh, I call five terms, or we call five terms, and you tell yeah what comes to your mind. Um, the first one, music. My life. James Horner. A great friend and a great musician. Um, Britain. Did, did you say Britain? Britain, yes, <laughs> sorry. Um, my reply to that would be Scotland. Hollywood. Hollywood. Um, A necessary evil. And yeah, the last one, hobbies. That's an easy one, paintings. And when I say mm -hmm. paintings, that's not to say that um, I paint. I like to look at them. So I go to galleries all the time. That's my hobby. And I'm sure there would be many Horner fans who would listen to this interview. Uh, do you have any message uh, for Horner fans on our page? Just this, that um, it's one of the greatest privileges of my life to have met and to have worked with James Horner. I lament his passing, but... He has given us so much to be grateful for, and for that, I'm truly grateful. <laughs>